we're talking about what fish is very extra logic uh, said the very fish was doing a lot better and as soon as all the COVID stuff was uh, oh, now to get over since he's going to come back we're glad to hear that also had a, a lot of birthdays that have added to the list this morning we had uh, King of Israel the 12th Heather Dees on the 3rd Shelby Bozak on the or Shelby LaVale on the 12th, Austin LaVale on the 31st, and Corey Watson on the 18th. I'd like to wish all these a happy birthday. That's all I have for the match. If you got anything, get to it. I'll announce the thing about Some glad morning when the sun is on. Galatians chapter 1, verse 6, beginning, says this, I marvel that you're so soon removed from him that calls you into the grace of Christ and to another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that troubled you that would pervert the gospel of Christ. Though we are an angel of heaven preach any other gospel unto you that we have been preached, uh, unto, that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, and so say now again, if any man preach another gospel unto you than that which you have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Do I now seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. One of the most frequently used phrases in Christian circles is the term the gospel. 
Amazingly, though, when we ask folks about what the gospel is, there's not a lot of folks who really know what the term means. It could either refer to its literal translation of good news, or it could come from the perspective that it's only the only thing that allows salvation through that death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It may surprise you just how few folks know what it is when it was asked of what uh, what the gospel is. Matter of fact, 1994, I saw a survey done by Barn Group. They do a lot of religious surveys. And, and when they asked, less than four out of ten had an idea of what the gospel was. 37%. Less than four out of ten. Uh, also, 34% of those they said they knew what it was, but when pressed on what the gospel was, they really had an inaccurate definition about what it meant. Even among those professing to be Christians, only about 60% correctly defined what the term, the gospel, meant in its expression. In the past 40 years or so, there's been an explosion of new gospels throughout the United States. And some of those new age belief systems are, are kind of rooted in Eastern mysticism and Hinduism and, and, and Buddhism and, and other kinds of things there that are kind of the, the, the um, I guess the charismatic type, afterlife, reincarnation type thing. So while there may be not those who buy into it wholeheartedly, in the last 40 years, we do hear things like karma. We hear terms like that, and it's based on those type of religions. We hear things like in my next life, or in my past life, I was, or I'm going to be. Those, again, are, are kind of new gospels that's been thrown around in our country. There's other gospels, as you could call it. They're based more on pop psychology than they are on the real gospel. There's Scientologists that's come in based on the, the teachings of a fellow who wrote a, a, a fantasy novels, L. Ron Hubbard. You've heard of Scientologists. Uh -huh. They have an appeal there for those people. A lot of Hollywood stars uh, had gotten caught up into that because that entertainment portion of uh, they, they are all together in, in pushing that kind of thing. There's Gospels that's based on gimmicks. There's Gospels that's based on people who like to do rodeos. And, and on and on you can go, there's different religious groups that form and have different ideas of what the gospel, the good news, the death, burial, and resurrection teaches, and, and its associated religious practices. A lot of different things. At the core of this letter that Paul's writing to the church in Galatia, he's writing to folks who have changed their course they have turned their life from the truth of God's word to something else. Back up and let's look at verse 6. Verse 6 in Galatians chapter 1. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him and called you into the grace of Jesus Christ unto another gospel. Paul's astonishment is not that there's other false teachers that exist. He knew that there were going to be false teachers that existed. His, his astonishment's not from them. His marveling's not from them. His, not, his astonishment is that so many people so quickly fell into their trap. He had expected false teachers. That was 20 verse 28. But he was surprised that this church was so easily misled. I marvel that you're so soon removed from him. You see, the philosophy of the world teaches us that the gospel needs to improve. That's the core, isn't it? That's the way that the life is. We evolve, and so the gospel needs to evolve too. It's 2,000 years old. It needs to reflect the times. And so that's a philosophy that the world wants to teach us. And the four verses that we're going to look at here I want us to consider some things, some principles for them, and, and why they must remain unchanged. 
how they are unchanging in a world that's changing, that's ever evolving. The first principle is this, verse 7 of Galatians chapter 1. We need to understand that according to the scripture, the gospel needs no addition. These false teachers, let's think about this for a minute, looking at our lesson text there. These false teachers are not openly denying the gospel message. They're just adding to it. They're just embellishing it a little bit. There's a popular religious group today. They'll go around from house to house, and they will offer you a testament, the New Testament, which we know. We've got this, right? And then they'll give you another testament. It's an addition to it. They're not denying that the other one's wrong. They're just adding to it. They're improving it. And that's what these false teachers were doing back in Galatians. They just want to try to improve it. They want to add to it. There's new ceremonies. There's new standards. There's new requirements. But verse 7, I'm so I'm, I'm astonished that you're so soon removed and take, taking you and teaching you another gospel. Verse 7, which is not another. But there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. It's as if they're saying, you know, we believe in Jesus, but we got something we want to add to it. In other words, they don't want to abolish the gospel, they want to pervert the gospel. That's what we can imply from this verse. That they, that they say, well, you know, this what these guys are believing is just not sufficient. There's something else that needs to be added in change because you know times change what they viewed as another gospel was actually what he said Paul said was a perverted gospel it's just not the same we was talking about back a while ago we was talking about some of the, the fun houses and things that we used to see and go and Stupid old fire was no exception. It was a huge, always a huge deal on Stupid old fire. And I remember when I go there, they always had these fun houses. And it was a house of mirrors. If anybody ever went to the house of mirrors, that was a neat thing. Sometimes it was. You could go up to these different mirrors, and it'd make you look completely different. And some of them make you look like you had a, 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 a forehead about this long. There's some of them that make you look like he's about this tall, about this wide. And then my favorite one, it was one that make you look like you're about seven feet tall, about this wide. Now that's the one I want to take home with. The problem is, it's a false reflection. It, it's not real. It, it, it might have my image, but it wasn't me in reality. See, he goes on to verse 7 to clarify. It says that the, you're teaching you another gospel, which is not another. But there are some who will trouble you and want to pervert this gospel of Christ. Paul says that this twisting and distorting of the gospel is not really the gospel at all. These mirrors that have these twists and turns, they distorted the image, but it's not the real thing. It's not what it's supposed to be. It's a counterfeit. Counterfeit gospel. Not real. Not something that we can just say, oh, if you don't believe this, you believe this, it's all okay. Paul said it's not. There's counterfeits. There's there's perversions, but they're not real. And folks, you're being taken away by what God applied to. I'm astonished how quickly you're taken away by you're taken away from him by them, verse six. Not only does the gospel not need any additions, but number two, the gospel, if if it's distorted, that's serious business. Distorting that gospel, changing things. Verse 8, Paul, he, he invokes a curse on anyone, including himself, who attempts to go in and distort the gospel message. Verse 8, look at it, and he, and he clarifies it again in verse 9. But though we, me included, though we are an angel from heaven, he says, now here's the, here's the thing, it don't matter if it's domestic, it doesn't matter if it's mystical in nature. If it tries to tell you another gospel, if it tries to preach any other gospel to you than another that you have been that's been preached to you, let him be accursed. Now, the King James, I don't think, does a, uh, in any of the translations, really, 
It gives us an accurate picture of just how detestable that this is going to take place, but we'll talk more about it in a minute. Let's keep on looking. As we said before, I'm going to reiterate this, he says. As I said before, and I'll say again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you that that, that you have received, let him be accursed. There's a real problem, obviously. There's a real problem that there's another gospel that's being taught out there. Not only is it from the standpoint of just being a bad idea, but it's something that's dangerous. It's dangerous for you to follow it. It's dangerous for you to pervert it. And in our sensitive English translation again, I think we lose some of the heat involved in these verses here. The original language, verse 8, let him be accursed. Verse 9, let him be accursed. These individuals will be accursed, separated from God, and eternally punished. It's a lot, lot harder language, isn't it? Than we might think. It's so it, it's such a it's such a, a curse that's been placed out there. Paul says, I gotta talk about it twice. I said it before, let me say it again. Don't pervert that gospel. Why? Because it's dangerous. It's dangerous. Thirdly, the gospel doesn't need to change because it's the only gospel that saves. It needs no additions. Distorting it is serious business. It's dangerous. And it's the only gospel that saves. Back up in verse 4, Paul reminds the believer that Christ, it was Christ who gave himself for our sins. God who gave himself, or who gave himself for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father. He reminds us of that gospel. Here's what it is. As Christians here in 2021 in America, you know, we believe in the freedom of religion as a people. But now, just because we believe in the freedom of religion, it does not mean that all religions are equally true. Okay? Now, that doesn't mean that I'm hateful by making that statement, and it's not hateful that you would believe that statement or that you share that statement. Just because a country believes in the freedom of religion, it does not mean that all the truths of those different religions are equally true. Can be. Jesus made that very plain. John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one cometh to the Father except by me. Not all religions are the truth, not all gospels are the truth. Jesus says, I am the truth. No other. The writer of Acts reiterates this very thought in Acts 4 verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other. For no other name under heaven given among men by which one must be saved. Only the gospel saves. It doesn't need to be changed. Because it's the only one that saves. Number four. Finally, only the gospel changes lives. Only the gospel changes lives. We were talking this morning a little bit about some debates and things. And once, once there was a challenge by H.B. Uh, Hughes, who was an evangelist, he was challenged by an atheist by the name of Charles uh, Bradlock. And back then, this was pretty popular to have debates. They're not as popular as they, they used to be. It used to be one of those big deals where it would last for a week, sometimes more, and every night those buildings would be packed and people were interested in seeing those kind of things. And so this atheist challenged this evangelist to a debate, and the preacher accepted the challenge with a condition. Here was his condition. He says, I'll accept your challenge to debate you on this day if you will let me bring a group of men and women 
who can tell what their lives have been as a direct result of being a Christian. And you bring a group of men and women to share what great things have happened in their lives as a result of being an atheist. Said that night, Cain. Brother Hughes brought those people to share what great things the Lord had done in their lives. The other man never showed up. When we lose the gospel, we lose the only message that has the power to heal us. When we lose the message of that great physician, then we lose the medicine, the only medicine that can cure us. We see the power of the gospel in the story of that demon-possessed man in Luke chapter 8. And I've had several stories. That's, that's, a, that's a story that's a, got a lot of lessons to teach from. And remember that story. That demon-possessed man, he experienced many horrors at the hands of that possession there and at the hands of his neighbors and family and friends. Their attempts to, to try to, to, to bind him there. Uh, he suffered a great deal in that agony. But then we're told down in verse 35 of Acts of the of, uh, Luke 8, we see that if they find this man, when the demons had departed, he's sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind. There's no chance on this man anymore. He's not on any kind of uh, uh, sedation. He's no longer screaming. He's no, trying, no longer trying to harm himself. He was sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed in his right mind. That's what we lose if we lose the gospel. We lose the power to change lives. In verse 10, Paul tells the reader why he saved these things. For do I now persuade men of God do I now seek to please men? For if I, if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. Paul says, I'm not doing this to be some super preacher. I'm not doing this to be sensational. I'm not doing this or saying these things for a, some hearty amens on a topic that's good and safe. Paul says, I'm not doing that. He says, I'm saying these things because there's only one truth. And because the gospel message that Jesus Christ came and died for men's sins is the only real truth. That he rose, to get, he rose again on that third day and he sits on the right hand of God and he defeated that death, that last enemy. He says, I'm here to speak that truth. An unchanging message for an ever-changing world is the gospel message. Folks, it doesn't need additions to it. It don't have to change. It don't have to roll with the times. As a matter of fact, distorting that gospel has some very serious consequences to it because only the gospel message can save men from their sins and only the gospel changes lives. That's why in an ever-changing world, there's an unchanging gospel and it is sufficient. This morning we're going to sing a song of encouragement for you. If you've not obeyed the gospel, this is a great opportunity because there's no, none other promised in this one. A wonderful opportunity to be a part of, of something that's greater than, than any title a man can wear. That title being Christian. The Lord adds you to the church such as should be saved. There may be those this morning who need prayers for strength, prayers for forgiveness of sins. Prayers and some things that are difficult in your life. And, and this is an opportunity to ask for these prayers, to pray together with you, to, to be able to, to share these things together because that's the way the Lord designed the church is to be here for one another. How wonderful that is. Your substance of gospel call, won't you come as we stand together and as we sing? Who at the door is standing
Bring us back at the next point of time. Last night. 